I appreciated Dr. Monica Hart's sermon last Sunday. If you haven't listened to it yet, you really should. She spoke to something all of us feel from time to time. She called it spiritual hunger, spiritual hunger. So I'd like to continue that language of hunger this morning, and I would like for us to consider one of the ways, just one of the ways, in which we feel our spiritual bellies growl. We are hungry for something these days. And this something is a word, a theme, that has run through our readings assigned to us this morning. The word is wisdom. I used to be a night owl. I used to be for years. I was a night owl. I loved to stay up late, sometimes into the wee small hours of the morning. One reason I did that is I was just convinced. I was convinced that I would miss something important. A friend wanting to hang out or drop by suddenly. A conversation that needed to happen. A thought to think. An idea to hatch. Something to feel, right? I didn't want to miss out on anything. And I was just convinced that if I didn't stay up late, that's exactly what would happen. So I'd stay up. Just another night owl. Not anymore. No, Suri Bob. I am pleased to say for several years now, this old night owl has transformed into a morning bird. I cannot, repeat, cannot stand being up late. Sure, it happens from time to time still, whatever's going on around our house or what life calls for, but I can't stand not getting a good night's sleep. And I am no longer concerned if I'm missing out on anything at all. Where I once lived with this kind of FOMO, this resting FOMO, y'all know FOMO, fear of missing out. I now live with this resting JOMO, the joy of missing out. <laughs> These days, I am happy to spend time with a friend and I am just as happy when plans get canceled. Either way, it's good. And I am totally okay with that. In fact, I really love it. I do. A big reason I really love it so much is because I enjoy my morning routine. I do. I do. I enjoy waking up early before everyone in the house is up, before the sun rises, pouring a cup of coffee, sitting beneath a single lamp in a dark house, being still, quiet, deep breaths, checking my 16 weather apps, reading, writing, I mean, I need this, y'all. I need it. I want it. This grounds me. It, it centers me before I embark on my day. But sometimes, sometimes within my morning routine, my center gets thrown. Sometimes the ground beneath me shifts. Sometimes it can be really difficult because a part of this routine of mine involves reading the news. And I'll read this columnist who might be writing one thing, and then I'll read another columnist who's writing something completely different on the same story, and I'm trying to stay informed. I'm trying to understand what's occurring in our world, in our community, in people's lives. And then I go to the gym, and above all the cardio machines are these televisions, most of them tuned into 24-hour news channels across the political spectrum, and their images flash over and over and over again, and their headlines scroll across their screens in big bold letters and even though they're all on mute somehow it feels like they're all screaming and it gets me thinking about other things it gets me thinking about my wife and our children and the world they live in and the world they're going into and their struggles and their challenges in our life as a family and sometimes maybe a lot of times it's hard and it's confusing and in those moments, I feel the spiritual hunger pangs, and one of the things I am most hungry for is wisdom. How about you? Be careful. Be careful, Paul writes those words. Be careful how you live, not as unwise people, but live as wise people. But you know what? See, Paul, that is the problem. Right? Isn't that the problem? We're trying, Paul. 
You can almost hear their response to his letter to the Ephesians way back there in the first century with these people who lived in a Greco-Roman culture that was filled to the brim with competing visions and versions of wisdom. In some ways, maybe similar to ours. We're trying, Paul, we're trying to be wise, but it's hard. It's a confusing world. We're trying. How does a wise person live? How does a wise person live? Do you know? Think about it. And when you hear that phrase, wise person, who pops into your thoughts? What person comes to mind? What visage glides across the waters of your memory? Who do you think of? I think about my grandfather. He seemed wise to me because he was always quiet. He didn't say much. Nonetheless, at times, especially as I got older, I found myself on his back porch asking his advice. Like this one time, like two weeks before Eric and I got married, I was there on his back porch in Odessa, and I was nervous. <laughs> Thoughts were racing. And I wasn't sure if I could be enough, right? I wasn't sure if I could do this. And so I asked him, I said, Papa, Papa, you and Mama have been married for like over 50 years. Did you know way back then, did you absolutely know that you could do it? Did you know that you and Mama would make it this long? Well, he paused for a bit and lowered his head, and I could, I could tell that my Papa was choosing words carefully. And then he looked up, and he looked into my face, and he said, Buddy, I never thought your grandma would live this long. <laughs> and then he winked at me, and he shot this mischievous grin. But that's wisdom, right? That's wisdom. Because, because he calmed me, right? He brought me into his stillness. He gave me counsel without giving me counsel. He gave me advice without giving me advice. I don't know, though. You can't copy that kind of wisdom. You can't copy wisdom like that, and you can't buy wisdom in the marketplace of virtues. We wish we could, but we can't. So how do wise people live? Don't be foolish. Don't be foolish. Paul writes, make the most of your days. Don't waste your life in drunkenness. Now this was Paul's not-so-subtle nod to the various cultic practices and religious rites and ceremonies that involved drinking to excess and involved all kinds of other things that happened in excess. And I believe he might even be nodding to a particular book of poetry and song that we call the Psalms when it says, Teach us to number our days, O oh God. Teach us to number our days so that we may gain a heart of wisdom. This letter, though, doesn't leave us to hang our hat just on a short or long list of don'ts. That would never, ever be enough. Paul, all through this letter of Ephesians, he's trying to articulate what the Christ filled life looks like, how it is expressed, what resurrection looks like when we actually practice it, embody it in our lives, express it through community. And so he moves us to see that actually a way in which we can live wisely, a way in which we can walk with wisdom, as the ancient Hebrew literature loved to say, he says, you want to live wise live lives characterized by praise and thankfulness. He says it right there. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody to the Lord in your hearts. Sing. One of the things I loved about the church growing up is, is that's where I got to hear people sing, especially the people in my life I never heard sing anywhere else. I never heard my dad sing. I've never heard my dad sing, not, not in the car, not in the kitchen, not some melody drifting across the house in the morning from his bedroom, but 
I heard my dad sing in the church. I never heard my grandparents sing. But I would go to church with my grandparents. And I, and I would hear my grandmother sing in that old lady falsetto voice. I'm not going to impersonate it, but y'all know what I'm talking about. Oh, okay, it goes like this. You know, you know what I'm saying. And I had this uncle that went with us, right? I had this uncle. And, and I noticed when he would sing his eyes would well up with tears. Some of my earliest memories in church, I, I wasn't being taught the scriptures. I wasn't being taught some catechism or some doctrinal statement. No, someone was teaching me to sing. Someone was teaching me a song to make a melody to the Lord in my heart. See, St. Andrews, we sing our psalms here. We sing our hymns and our spiritual songs because they train us in the art and the act of praise. To live a life filled with praise. And when we are able to do that, when we are a people well practiced in praise, I can't help but think we then become a people who are able to give thanks to God at all times for all things. Even when times are tough, even when something in the world is frightening or confusing in the life of your family or your marriage or your friendships or your work or whatever it may be, whatever distresses you, leaving you to toss and turn in the middle of the night, even then, even then there is something within us that can actually offer up our thanks to God. Be careful. Paul writes, be careful to live as wise people. And he doesn't give us a list of opinions, and he doesn't give us a set of beliefs, and he doesn't equate with wisdom with intellectual assent or cognitive exercises. He says, live wisely. I love the words of Richard Rohr when he writes, we do not think ourselves into new ways of living. We live ourselves into new ways of thinking because that's what wisdom does it gives shape to our lives lives not intended to remain spiritually satisfied nor stay spiritually hungry lives lived with thankfulness and lives lived with praise amen